I'm starting with a function little f of t and taking its Laplace transform. I've used the normal notation of capital F of s and written down the definition using the usual integral and the negative exponential. I now want to ask the question, can we take the Laplace transform instead of df by dt, the derivative of f? The derivative of f is sometimes written as f dot when the variable is t, so I'll use both those notations. To take its Laplace transform, what we need to do is substitute inside the integral with df by dt instead of f. It should look rather like this. Well, as you can see, there's no problem writing down what the Laplace transform should look like, but can we make any sense of it? Is it useful? Think for a moment, where have we seen derivatives inside an integral before? This can happen in a number of places, but one of the important places where we see a df dt, or d something dt, inside an integral is in the formula for integration by parts. I've written out that formula on the next page. Here it is. I'd like to compare the left-hand side of this formula with the Laplace transform that I've just written down. Let's write it out underneath on the left. I've left off the integration limit 0 to infinity, for the moment at least. We can put those back later. In order to be as suggestive as possible, to make a correspondence between the two integrals, I've reordered the second one and written the exponential first. That doesn't make any difference to the value of the integral. I think we can now see that it looks as though it might be sensible to make a choice that u corresponds to the negative exponential and dv by dt corresponds to df by dt. Let's write out that correspondence and then explore the effects. Here's the correspondence. That's the choice I've made for u and for dv by dt. That choice will have consequences for du by dt and v. We can write those consequences down easily enough. I'll do that in a different colour. Differentiating our u simply pulls out a minus s from the exponential and leaves the exponential intact after that. Integrating df by dt simply gives f, so that v must be the same as f. We now substitute all four of these results into the integration by parts formula. That's why I've left a space on the right. We'll do that now. First of all, there's the uv term. That will be e to the minus st times v, which is f of t. After that, there's the integral term. Minus the integral v, that's f of t, and du by dt, that's negative s times e to the minus st. But now remember that our Laplace transform had integration limits on, 0 to infinity. We need to impose those on both sides of this equation. Wherever we see an integral, we simply put on the limits, 0 to infinity. But on the right hand side there is a term that's already been integrated, the e to the negative st times f of t. Here we simply record on the right hand side that we have to substitute the lower and upper limits. I'm going to move on to another page now and write this formula out again. But remember that the left hand side is just the Laplace transform of df dt. So I'll write it that way. On the right hand side I'll keep the first term without doing anything to it for the moment. Look at the second term, the integral. There's a negative in front of it and a negative s inside. The two negatives will combine to make a positive. The s is independent of t and so it can be pulled outside of the integral. Let's write this out now on the next page. Here's the left hand side, L of df dt. On the right we need to record the two parts from the integration by parts. Here they both are. As promised I've pulled the s out the front and combined the two negatives to make a positive. We have to look at these two terms separately on the right. We have, in the first term we have to substitute the limit 0 and also take the limit as t goes to infinity and take the difference in the usual way for integration limits. Now remember that f of t started off having a Laplace transform, capital F of s. 
The very fact that it has a Laplace transform is telling us something about that limit as t goes to infinity. In fact, it's telling us that f of t behaves well enough that the exponential will cancel it as t gets very big. So when we substitute the top limit of infinity, we end up with zero. Technically, the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the minus sn times f of n is zero. We've talked about that elsewhere. Once that top limit has been substituted and the whole thing has cancelled, we're left with the bottom limit to put in. The exponential of zero is just one, and so we end up with just f of zero, but because it's a bottom limit, there will be a minus in front. Thus we'll get minus f of zero. Now look at the other term, the integral. Apart from the s, that's just the Laplace transform of f again. So it's now easy to write that term out. It's just s times capital F of s. Here's the final answer. We normally write it out in the opposite order, with the s f of s first. This is a very useful result. Using it, we would be able to solve certain first-order differential equations using Laplace transforms. That's the topic of another screencast. For the moment, though, I want to carry on the logical sequence that we've started here. If we can find the Laplace transform of a first derivative, what about a second, a third, or even an nth derivative? Can we find L of d2f by dt squared? Or come to that, L of dnf by dt to the n? Well, the answer is yes. And there's some good news, too. We don't have to repeat the integration by parts over and over again. All we have to do is identify the pattern that is happening when we take the Laplace transform of a derivative. When we started with the function little f of t and asked for L of its derivative, the answer we got was that we have to take the Laplace transform of the f and multiply it by s, and then subtract the function f, the original function, evaluated at zero. That's the formula above the line. Now a second derivative is just a first derivative of df by dt. So we should be able to extrapolate the rule without doing any more integrations. Here's how we do it. Write the second derivative as the first derivative of a first derivative. Now the Laplace transform for d by dt of something is simply s times the Laplace transform of the something minus, again, the something evaluated at zero. But here our something is itself df by dt. So the Laplace transform of the second derivative must just be s times L of df dt. And then we have to subtract df by dt evaluated at zero. It's easier to use the notation with f dot to write this. Now all we have to do is substitute for L of df by dt from the previous page. Let's quickly remind ourselves what that said. s times f of s minus f of zero. OK, we can do that easily enough. Here it is, and of course we mustn't forget the minus f dot of zero at the end as well. We can now expand the brackets, and we've got our standard expression for the Laplace transform of d2f by dt squared. Once we've identified the pattern that's happening here, we should be able to write down the Laplace transform for any number of derivatives. For example, the third derivative will have s cubed times capital F of s. There'll be an extra s on the f of zero as well, so it'll be minus s squared f of zero. There'll now be an s on the f dot of zero. And finally, we will be subtracting f double dot of zero. We'll write this on the next page. Here it is. Well, now that we've really understood this pattern, we can write out the form for the nth derivative. Here it is finally. Notice how the power of s attached to the capital F of s is just the same as the number of derivatives, s to the power n. After that, we have all negatives, 
power of s decreases by 1 as we go, whereas the derivatives on the f gradually increase from none to 1 to 2 and so on until finally we stop at the n minus 1th derivative, one less than the n in the original expression on the left hand side. The notation we use for that sometimes is to put a little n minus 1 in brackets at the top of the f. That means the n minus 1th derivative. Armed with these expressions for the plus transforms of derivatives, we can use them to help us solve ordinary differential equations. They're particularly useful for solving linear first and second order differential equations. That concludes my presentation on this topic.